Good morning, everyone. It's a privilege to be able to speak for you today. I'm just trying to make sure you can see my screen. All right, so what I would like to um, talk about today is the importance of establishing a sterile preparation service in your hospital and, and exactly why that is so important. So I divided it into three learning objectives. We'll first look at the importance and what happens if there is uh, not experts at your facility and uh, what can happen with uh, drug errors, adverse events, uh, that sort of thing. Then I will talk about how to go about designing the compounding service and what references you'd want to refer to to design a service. And then finally, what are these references? Um, this is, I would say, is one of the most difficult barriers because there's no go-to single reference for everything. You have to know uh, what you need to know, and for most people, they do not know that. So I'm hoping to be able to help every ex uh, aspiring compounding pharmacist out there, as well as medication safety pharmacists, to uh, have a good start uh, in this field. So with the first learning objective, um, to understand the importance, uh, the number one thing we have to remember is that it's all for patient safety. That's going to be uh, number one in all of this. And what goes into that is an organized sterile compounding service where we, uh, we uh, look at the quality of the product, the education of the staff, of course, as well as the safety of the staff. Uh, but everything that we're going to do, as I talk about, is all to make uniform, consistent product that will, will be safe, as well as educating staff, nurses, doctors, pharmacists, to recognize when there's a problem and what, what could potentially go wrong. So, as I mentioned, patient safety is our priority number one. Uh, this, this is what regulations and recommendations and guidelines are all written for, for the safe preparation of these products. But we always want to keep that in mind whenever we do set up an IV room, set up a workflow system, label our products, educate our staff, um, everything. Specifically, when we're actually in the IV room, we want to make sure that we're we're working safely, we're not working too quickly that we will cause an error. Uh, I always try to train my staff that um, working, working too quickly will create errors as well as medication waste because you'll, um, you'll make the mistake and have to throw the whole batch out. You also have to make sure that the orders are verified correctly. The, the labeling is not just for the storage of the medication, it's also for the safe administration of the medication. So as we'll see in the presentation, it's not just about compounding, it's also about medication and safety. So involve everybody in all this type of education. Many of the problems that I see with compounding are um, if they're made in a, and they're contaminated. So that's a microbial contamination. Other issues is they may be made cleanly uh, with clean sterile product, but they're made in, in sanitary conditions, which would also lead to their contamination and unsafe uh, administration to the patient. They can be made incorrectly, such as the staff did not understand the steps to make it. They had no experience. They could be labeled incorrectly with the incorrect infusion rate, incorrect storage conditions, which may lead to uh, destabilization of the drug, many different things. Uh, this is one of the most famous problems that actually promoted the safe use of medications as well as the use of uh, the USP chapters. In 2012, it was the NECC, the New England Compounding Center, that led to a major fungal meningitis outbreak in the United States. They were compounding in the state of Massachusetts and shipping this product to many different states, which led to many deaths, as you see, and uh, a lot of harm to patients. And this was essentially from making the product in insanitary conditions and not paying attention to the quality assurance of the product. That would be testing of the product for sterility, um, testing of the environmental conditions inside the clean room, as well as the hoods to ensure that they were safe and they were free from fungus. And what happened is these epidurals were contaminated with black mold that led to injections of the black mold into the patients and ultimately 76 deaths. When I talk about medication safety, a great resource is the Institute for Safe Medication Practice. Um, it's, they have a regular newsletters which describe errors that are reported by pharmacists, compounders, nurses, and uh, I would definitely recommend that in addition to your compounding service, you also have a medication safety pharmacist and they would review that newsletter and create education for the staff. The newsletter has drug compounding errors, administration errors, and they also give recommendations to reduce those errors. And you can put that into your own employee education, review it once a week, and recognition of the errors will help the staff become more alert to their own issues. And 
I always like to tell my students and the new pharmacists I'm teaching is, is it's better to learn from other errors than your own errors. So make sure you take a look at that. In the hospital with administration, we see that there's so many errors and 90% of the hospitalized patients will be receiving IV therapy. So if 61% of those serious and life-threatening errors are related to the IV therapy, you see there's a, a large um, possibility of risk here for patients. And we have to work on reducing this risk. In this case, this is related to the administration. So when we see that there's a lot of administration errors, what can we do as pharmacists? Uh, we can try to play a, an active role in the education for nurses. We can make sure that the drug references, the labels, and the IV pump programs are not confusing, and we standardize as much as possible to reduce those errors. I would also recommend that you have a pharmacist on staff uh, that is uh, the expert on all of the uh, technology that is employed in the hospital, so that is the EMR, the pumps, um, all of that, and make sure there's regular communication with the IV pharmacist to make sure things are standardized and there's regular communication with new standard concentrations, updates, new preparations, new sizes, the volume of the product, if there's a change from 100 ml to 250 ml, that there's a seamless transition to those in the pumps as well as the EMR. Now with the, back to the compounding room, we can see the sources of errors and where they may occur. Um, this will be related to staff education and staff training. If staff are regularly working in the IV room all day long, every day, they may become complacent or just used to seeing things and they may uh, assume that something is what they think it is, but it could be labeled differently, a different drug, a different concentration, so they become complacent. So the, the uh, point there is to ensure that they're always alert and they never um, um, review a medication and think think that it is the same as it was yesterday. They may have a lack of knowledge, a, a lack of standardization that comes down to the um, different concentrations of the products. You should have a chart at your hospital that describes the concentrations, the size and the volume and the certain type of fluid that the product would be in and ensure that those concentrations do not look like each other. There's a number of different errors, especially in pediatric pharmacy where you can have a tenfold concentration uh, error given to a patient if you have a, as an example of 0 0.2 milligram per ml concentration and a two milligram per ml concentration, sometimes the decimal point is uh, not seen and it leads to a tenfold error. So if you, are do, if you do design uh, standard concentrations, make sure the numbers are slightly different. So perhaps one milligram per ml and 0.2 milligram per ml. Also make sure there's a formal training process and everyone goes through that and make sure that there are no routine practice deviations, no cutting corners, there should be a designated person that is the expert at the site, which I'll explain uh, shortly, that oversees all of this and makes sure that the training is done regularly. It should be done at least annually and uh, in a diverse way with uh, reading, a formal education, uh, didactic education. Um, you will see that soon. Um, this is a very sad error with Emma Legere, and um, this relates to uh, working too quickly in the IV room, uh, a little bit of lack of knowledge and uh, a lot of unfortunate events. And what it was is uh, Sunday morning, a nurse was repeatedly requesting a staff prescription from the pharmacy and it was etoposide and normal saline 150 ml. And it was supposed to be the last chemotherapy um, for this patient before she went home. Now, if you do have experience working in an IV room as well as an oncology room, you know that there's no such thing as a staff chemotherapy. Uh, but um, in this case, they, were, they felt the pressure and they were trying to get it done. Um, the IV room was busy. The, this was also a period where there was uh, shortages of normal saline uh, in the market, and the hospital was forced to make their own normal saline using sodium chloride 23.4% mixed with sterile water. Now, when the pharmacist was checking the preparation, he saw the sterile water IV bags. He saw the vials of 23.4%. He assumed that the preparation of etoposide was made with, with the normal saline and he proceeded to check it off. It went out to the patient and uh, shortly after the infusion started, the, uh, Emily cried out that she, her head hurt and then went limp and they were not able to revive Emily back after that. They did a root cause analysis on it and what happened was that the bag was made with pure 23.4% sodium chloride and etoposide. There was no dilution. 
the, the IV room was too busy and it also happened to be the same day that the normal saline batched bags were prepared. So the pharmacist saw the sterile water bags that would have been used to make normal saline and assumed it was made for this preparation as well, which was a mistake. The technician uh, explained they were overworked. They were also skipping breaks and it was too busy. And that was essentially it. So if you think about all these issues that go into it, uh, we have to learn and make sure our IV room is being uh, used in a controlled way, that there are uh, limited distractions, that things are easy to understand as far as checking the preparation off. Things are clear with master formulas. The technicians know exactly what needs to be made. And also, this was produced on the weekend on a shift where the staff member would not normally make this preparation. So something else you can consider too is ensuring that chemotherapy is made on regular days and regular periods and that all staff, if they're going to be making chemotherapy, are educated in those preparations. I have examples of more errors. So we can see here, if you are the pharmacist and the technician hands you this amphotericin B intravitreal injection, is this correct? Would you sign this off as correct? Now, most of us know if we're pharmacists that amphotericin B is yellow. So we just look at this and oh, it must be correct, it's yellow. Same right drug, it's not clear. Well, if you don't have experience in making preparations for the eye or have seen this before, this could be a problem. You may have signed this off and sent it out to the patient. When in fact, it was supposed to be five microgram per 0.1 ml, but it was made as 500 micrograms. So it's 100 times the concentration. You can see on the far right syringe, that is what the correct one looks like. It's a very slight hint of yellow. What happened was, is the technician diluted the vial. The first dilution drew up the dose in the syringe and sent it. What needed to happen was a serial dilution of multiple steps to get down to that five micrograms per 0.1 ml. And you can read there on the slide the damage to the patient's eye. Now, how would we correct this? Well, we have in our master formula, what is the final preparation? What should it look like? A, a dark yellow, a light yellow? If, if you are working at a hospital that makes eye injections, make sure you have some type of an education piece that explains how eye injections are made, what they look like. Pictures are great, as you see here. Um, education is always going to be the key to promote patient safety. What about this? You've been handed this as the pharmacist, or better yet, if we, if we use the exact case, this is the nurse. The nurse receives this syringe and she's prepared to give it to the patient. Now the syringe is going to be wrapped in a light protect bag because it's required for nitroprusside. For adults, it would be presented in a bag. However, for children, you may see it as a syringe because it'll be attached to a syringe pump. Now the nurse sees this and questions it. You should too because this is not the correct color of the final preparation of sodium nitroprusside. This means there has been degradation of the drug, likely due to light or some type of a pH or oxidation. The actual drug itself will be pulled out of the syringe in an orange color, as you see, a dark orange. And then once diluted, it'll be a light orange to a pink to a brown. The incorrect color of the final preparation should not be dark orange or bright orange or dark brown, or in this case, as you see, blue. And that's all related to light decomposition. So this would be part of your master formula. But remember, I also said who was catching this was the nurse. So as pharmacists and as drug experts, we have the opportunity in the hospital to educate nurses as well as, as, well as physicians. So you should offer to have nurse compounded drug and administration of drugs uh, class at least once a year as well as if a, a new hire nurse to explain how you make these preparations, uh, what do they look like? And you may, if you want, you can even have the, on the label, what the final preparation should look like on special case syringes like this. Uh, report if syringe is blue, green, or red, things like that. And they should also be inspecting the preparation before they give it to the patient. So we see a little bit of the importance here about education and compounding errors, but let's take a look at the design of a sterile compounding service and what that looks like. Uh, you first need to start with a designated person. And this is just this role is described in the different USP chapters. And briefly put, 
they would oversee the entire compounding operation. They would have to meet a certain level of competency and you can look at national guidelines for that. There are new certifications now from the Board of Pharmacy Specialties for um, board certified sterile compounding pharmacists. You can also go to ASHP for a sterile compounding certificate. Those are great ways to have uh, very detailed education on compounding. And you can see all the other roles listed. They should be experts, not just in the, guide, the guidelines as well as the um, you know, regulatory compliance that uh, 797 would describe, but also experts in the arts of compounding. You know, how do you make this preparation? You know, experts in drug stability and where to look all of that. And once they're the expert, then they are the key person to create the education for the rest of the staff, from pharmacy to nursing to physicians. But where do you start? That's, like I said, there is no actual drug or reference to go to for this. I mean, we can look at uh, regulations, uh, you know, in best practice, um, we have to know a little bit about medication safety and uh, the basics art and science of compounding. So what books do we go, you know, where do we start? It's, it is a lot for a person to handle, but you know, you always, there's always other experts to ask and I'll explain some references later. Uh, we can start with the USP chapters. Um, even though the, these are the 2019 versions that are, that are temporarily on hold, um, they are organized extremely well and have great specific, uh, specific descriptions of what the designated role of the pharmacist should be. And as that designated person, you would be responsible for the compounding for sterile preparations, non-sterile preparations, as well as the protection of staff from hazardous drugs. You can organize your whole designated compounding or your, your uh, sterile compounding service in a format like this. Just remember that patient safety is the number one goal, so I put that in the middle and education uh, from staff is, uh, I would say, the most important to trying to reduce errors. For, that's why I put that first. So we'll look at employee education, how to set that up, the quality assurance, basics of that, uh, regulatory compliance. That would be looking at reg recommendations and also following uh, local and national uh, and international standards, what the compounding process would look like, and then a little bit of employee safety. So with that education, you wanna make sure that your education actually matches your operation. Do not go buy a book that says uh, compounding education and just have them read that because most of that may not make sense. You should have it tailored specifically to your site. If you're mostly making eye preparations, make sure that your education focuses on that. If it's just you know simple preparations, one vial to a bag, make sure you focus on that. Um, same thing with chemotherapy. For, for every individual role that is at or in your compounding operation, like chemotherapy or whatnot, you should have specific education that, that would meet all of those expectations of that person's role in the hospital. So it needs to be as advanced as the work that they are expected to do. Make sure it is direct and hands-on, so they're under direct observation of yourself as a designated person or other as a supervisor. Certainly incorporate video. I like making videos and putting those on YouTube because I'm not always present in my pharmacy. However, they can re review that as part of their education plan, as well as take an exam. The exam should be uh, written and verbal. Um, of course, you would directly observe their competency as far as the compounding, make sure the hand is uh, being held correctly to not obstruct the first air that is coming out of the hood. Regularly evaluate. I say um, you know, the requirements from 797 right now, the minimum requirements are once a year, but you can do it however often as you want or feel the need for, depending on what your observations of the staff are. Make sure all of the education is documented and that you are keeping track of everybody's education to make sure it's correct. And then it comes down to testing of the compounding staff. This would be media fills and fingertip tests as described in USP 797. I put together a image or uh, for you just to get an example of what this would look like. Most hospitals will probably have one single IV room with one type of hood and the LAFW will be that laminar airflow workspace. So if you have a new staff hire, you would have to do three initial tests with the fingertip test and that would be putting on your all of your garb. That's the, the mask, the hair covers, the shoe covers, and the gown in the, in the correct order. And then you would, uh, after they put their sterile gloves on in the, in the sterile method, then you would test their fingertips on agar plates. And you would do that once a day on three separate days. In addition to that, in the hood, you would have them do a media fill test. And that is just a, a sample test with this uh, has agar, liquid agar inside the bag, as well as some vials and uh, with needles and syringes. However, 
um, complicated your products are being made, that is how your media field test should match. You should not be doing complicated TPNs and then have a one vial to a one bag test. You would have to have a, a uh, practice TPN of some form with some media in it, and that would simulate your compounding process. After you do that media field test, immediately after, before they even clean up, uh, then you would have them sample with their gloves, um, left and right hand, uh, on the media plates. And that would test to see if, they're, if they had cleaned everything correctly. If you have different hoods, such as a CAI or a CACI, which are, are compounding aseptic isolators or a biological safety cabinet for the BSC if they're doing chemotherapy, then because that is a different compounding environment with different directions of airflow, you would have to do the media fill and fingertip test there as well. Make sure you monitor the, uh, the quality of your products. So you're doing the appropriate inspection of the finished product. That's looking for precipitations or rubber stopper core fragments. You also have to do uh, at least annually potency and sterility checks of some preparations in your um, operation. And that's described in USP 797 how you do that. Make sure that at least on a daily basis, you as the supervisor are monitoring the conditions of the clean room. So that's temperatures, the air pressure differentials between the rooms, the air changes per hour in the rooms and the humidity. Make sure you do certification of the clean room at least uh, every six months along with the equipment and that makes sure that everything is uh, operating and performing correctly as well as sampling of the air itself to make sure that uh, it has the minimum amount of particles to meet certain air conditions, ISO 5, ISO 7, ISO 8, that type of thing. For the temperatures, I threw a chart here, which I'm not gonna really go over. This is more of a reference for the, um, those that are getting their program started. You just make sure that you monitor the incubators um, daily if you have media in them, monitoring refrigerators and freezers. Um, just note that you make sure you must store your product as it is described by the manufacturer. So if USP 797 says a freezer range of negative 25 to negative 10 Celsius, you should also check the product to make sure that it should be stored at that temperature. In this case, uh, frozen products from Baxter would require 30 to or negative 30 to negative 20 Celsius. Also with the um, ISO levels, the, the classified air in the different clean room, ante room, and storage room, um, Within those areas, they also have controlled temperatures. So you want to have at least 18 to 20 degrees Celsius. Now, the reason for that, um, you want to have it colder as possible so that it's comfortable for the staff because you keep in mind, what are they doing? They're putting on a gown. They're putting on a hat and a mask and gloves and shoe covers. And sometimes they may be wearing a full suit. So they're going to get hot. Now, what happens when we get hot? We start to sweat. As we sweat, we throw off a whole lot more bacteria than usual, and then may be contaminated in the room. So we wanna make sure the staff are comfortable once they have all of that garb on and they're not sweating. When it comes down to air pressures, uh, this is essentially to ensure that the bacteria are kept out. So you have a higher pressure in the, in the clean room as it flows out into the ante room and it keeps the dirty air out. When it comes to hazardous compounding, that room would be negative pressure, but the ante room would have a positive pressure with cleaner air, and that would supply the clean air into the clean room. I'll show you a picture in just a moment. With humidity, it's not so much required in the USP 797 version 2008. It's highly recommended uh, in the 2019 version, which is not official yet. But the, the importance of humidity is that if you have a high humidity, that will lead to growth of bacteria and molds in the clean room. If you have too low, it may lead to some uh, malfunctions in electronic equipment, especially with static electric discharge. So you want to keep it in a safe range between 30 and 60. I've seen uh, some ranges that go as low as 20, which are appropriate. Uh, an example of a clean room with a shared ante room, I listed where the process, uh, positive and negative pressures would be, as well as air changes per hour if you're going to have a fully compliant functioning compounding suite. And there's uh, different methods to put on your sterile garb as you step over those lines of demarcations, which I will not talk about now. But when we look at the clean room design, we do have to do testing for viable sampling. That would be testing that the air is clean as well as the surfaces are clean and we're cleaning them daily. So where might we test this air for viable air sampling? We might do something like this. And this will be your role as a designated person. We would put a sampler inside the hoods as well as in the areas in the room. And the air is going to pull it, or the, the volumetric air sampler will impact the air as it pulls it down into an agar plate. And then you would take the agar plate and put it into an incubator and see what grows out. And if you have a lot of bacteria growing, that will indicate that there is a problem and your air is not clean. You can have a few bacterial colony forming units here and there. We certainly don't want any fungus growing, 
but it would be expected to see a fungus every so often in the anteroom on the dirty side because the anteroom is where dirty becomes clean. As we wash up, we put our gowns on, so it wouldn't be unexpected. Surface sampling, we might want to test these areas, high touch areas, maybe a corner of the sink. Uh, if you have doorknobs, you may want to do that. Uh, surfaces inside the, the hood to make sure those are cleaned appropriately. Uh, perhaps the handle on the chemo fridge. Uh, many different places, it's your best judgment as a designated person. Just make sure the high touch areas. You can reference these. These are from USP 797, the 2008 version. Um, this would be the amount of acceptable level versus unacceptable level in the cleaning room. So if I start with the orange table for viable air sampling, we would be allowed essentially just one uh, bacterial colony forming unit inside the hood. That's the ISO 5 air. We don't want any more than that. One may be possible, but make sure you monitor that. Anything more than that will be an action level and you have to uh, take steps. ISO 7 air would be the clean room air itself and you can have up to 10 before you, it's a problem and up to 100 in the anteroom, which is the ISO class 8 air. When it comes to the surface sampling, um, there's a little bit more that are allowed in the hood. Um, and we have up to five that's allowed in the clean room itself, the ISO 7 air. And then where I have in the yellow box, right in the 2008 version, it was uh, of USP 797, we were allowed up to 100 colony forming units in the anteroom. However, that'll drop down to 50 uh, in the 2019 version, which is not official. So an example plates. Now, depending on your surface or your air sampler, it can accommodate different types of plates. So on the left, this is um, a smaller plate as a contact plate. And you see, this is the colonies that I drew on it. There's one, two, three, four, five. So this would be appropriate for um, anteroom, uh, perhaps a clean room, but certainly not a hood. So on the right side is triptych soy agar with a sheep's blood as a, as a feed source for the bacteria. You can see here that this would likely fail uh, air samples. So um, this wouldn't be an issue. This is what a mold would look like. Uh, there's many different species of mold, of course, so they would all have different morphologies, but you can tell here it's raised. This uh, grew quite quickly. It's growing on triptych soy agar. You can also use malt extract dextrose agar, uh, many different types of agar as well, um, that would promote fungal growth. This would be an example of a completely failed test. Um, this would be very bad, and you can see it's so bad that the location of the colonies on the plate are actually matching the intake holes of the air sampler. And you can take a look closer and you can see there's some interesting morphology there, perhaps some fungus and some molds and uh, amongst the bacteria. So this would be something where you would stop, want to stop compounding and investigate this. Cleaning frequencies. This is a clip from the 2019 version of USP 797. I'm not going to walk through this completely because I have some slides in here that are for reference only. Uh, just know that there's, you have to clean certain areas on a daily basis as well as a uh, monthly basis. Per, uh, monthly is usually going to be control of spores using a sporicide and daily would be all the actual work surfaces and keep in mind you're also cleaning at least every 30 minutes and between batches when you're compounding inside the hood. How might you set this up? Well the previous chart was just explaining the frequency but you have to have some type of an education or a poster for your staff to go by and this is where you would insert your cleaning chemicals and make sure they're used appropriately in the right order and how long they would be there. So in the case of a, like a text Q, which is a quaternary ammonia, if you would look at the label and it says you need to have it on the surface for at least 10 minutes to have a killing effect, then it needs to be 10 minutes. Paradox RTU, which is nice, it kills everything, viruses, fungus, spores, and even um, decontaminates chemotherapy uh, surfaces, that just needs to be on for three minutes. So you wanna make an education piece like this for staff and make sure they're following everything in your policies and procedures. As far as cleaning the hood, there's also a certain method we would do that. You would start at the filter at the top and then work on the back of the hood, then the two sides, and then the floor of the hood, and then finally the glass. You can use your hand or you can use a tool. The tool is very easy to get in those tight places and make sure if it is a, it does have an under tray, you'd at least clean that once a week. And when I mention about uh, cleaning chemicals, that would be some an order something like using sterile water to uh, d dissolve any drug residues that are crystallized there, if any are present, then you can use your cleaning agent and then finally sterile alcohol to wipe up any residues of the cleaning agent. As far as the regulatory compliance, make sure you have detailed policies and procedures for everything that you're going to be doing in the clean room and this will cut down on errors. Make sure that you're cleaning and monitoring everything. And then also following any additional regulations that could be there. And then 
local and national. When it comes down to the master formulas, I won't go through this, but I did provide an example for those that are going to be creating these. It's a description that's very detailed of all aspects of the compounding process, from the ingredients to the beyond your state selection, the equipment you will use, any specific process, dispensing notes, labeling, and quality reviews, and what is the resulting color and what it should look like. Beyond these dates, this would be for uh, under USP 797 and how we would set that if it is a one vial to one bag example, or if it's a TPN, that might be medium risk. And this would be the storage conditions that you would have before you can start that infusion. On the 2019 version of 797, I highlighted the part that would make sense to us in a hospital compounding program. So that would be aseptically processed compound and sterile preparations. We would not be doing a sterility test. We would be using sterile products. And under this guideline, we would have four days of room temperature or 10 days refrigerated or 45 days frozen uh, that you could actually keep the product before that you would uh, have to throw it out. Now, standardized preparations, make sure that it's clearly written on the master formulas, how you will dilute it. It will be in dextrose, normal saline, what solution, what concentration, if it requires light protection, if it needs PVC or specifically non-PVC bags and infusion lines. Many chemotherapies are like that. What type of filters must be used in compounding or administration? And if it's supposed to be an IV piggyback or a syringe, specifically we would never send vinca alkaloids in syringe because there have been many errors on that. So always send those in IV piggybacks. For the compounding record, this is recording everyone who is involved in the preparation as well as uh, final Final notes, and this is in lot numbers and manufacturers. Checking the final product, you see we have an issue. If there is a, um, a white background, we can see a rubber stopper, but if it's a black background, we may not see a black rubber stopper, but we could see some uh, white drug pre precipitates. So make sure you check it on two different, uh, two different backgrounds. We did run a short study last year, um, or this year, for how our staff could actually see some stopper course. We did five bags that had stopper course amongst many other bags, and 28 members completed the survey. Uh, most were pharmacists, and then 12 were technicians. And what were the results is um, at least everybody saw one fragment. On two fragments, everybody saw that too. Seven people only caught three fragments. 14 people caught four fragments, and only eight caught all five fragments. So that means 71% of the staff did not identify all five of the stopper course. Now, what would that mean is you may go out and be infused to the patient. So you may ask yourself, do I need a filter to infuse everything? What, what should I do? Uh, well, it means that you should educate your staff to uh, appropriately compound using the right size needles, that they're doing the right quality reviews between the light and dark background. And if there's still going to be issues, then you can convert to using all filters. Make sure that you are educating staff on hazardous drugs, a safe work environment, safe working practices, and how to use an eye wash and where that would be. This is a relatively quick section about the resources available. Start with 797 and the other chapters. You can look at your professional societies, uh, join IVPN network, which is a, a mailing list of many different compounding pharmacists and those that do parental nutrition. There's many different other societies you can join. You can also work on getting a certificate. Uh, there's also courses and workshops from experts. I said Board of Pharmacy Specialties was a good one too, so take a look at that. Many different guidelines from the USP to NIOSH for hazardous drugs to ISMP to all the different guidelines from ASHP. And they have everything from ophthalmic products to compound and sterile preparations, it's great. Many different websites, take a look at these. They all have education materials. So if you don't wanna write your own, you can look at theirs to see if you wanna assign those to your staff. There's also many different drug apps, Lexicomp, up to date. Those will have compounding directions as well as micromedics and clinical pharmacology. Trussell's comes as an app as well as a book. But now uh, what books do you use? I'll flip through these fat, uh, quickly, but what's the best reference? I often get asked that. You know, we, I like uh, Trissel's and Bing's Extended Stability. King Guide has, uh, also organizes a bunch of other drug stability papers. All, you know, many different journals we can do. So this one is, is the number one we probably hear about Trissel's. So you can order the book. Uh, it's gonna organize everything on stability and also drug compatibility studies. There's uh, Extended Stability from Bing's and this, it's the same data, but it's organized a little bit more cleanly and uh, easier to see charts. This one, it is also trissels, but it's also non-sterile preparations and many different monographs. Uh, a lot more information you might be able to find here versus online. It's very easy reading. This is Lexicomp, the book form. What happens if your internet goes out or you wanna take this to a, a, an emergency? You don't wanna be checking 
your phone when there's a pediatric emergency and you have to figure out how to compound something, it's better to just have the book there. AHFS drugs is great. It also has extensive off-label uses and related drug dosings that you may not find in Lexicomp. Pediatric injectable drugs is, is excellent too because it's the same drug information you might find in other resources. However, it is curated by pediatric pharmacists uh, through the filter of their own education. Pediatric oral formulations, also oral and geriatric. This one's great for handbook of our enteral feeding tubes. And with all those references and everything I've discussed in the past, um, what I want you to take away from this is make sure you have a dedicated compounding service. Um, it's needed to standardize all the processes in the hospital IV room to promote patient safety. Um, your trained staff must follow a standard practice that will ensure the patient safety and the staff safety and then they should become the experts in drug compounding. And then each aspect of the USP guidelines is written with the ultimate goal of ensuring patient safety. So make sure you follow that. Here are the references and my presenter information.